Our scripture reading this morning is in Genesis chapter 49, verses 29 through 33. Genesis 49, 29 through 33. We're continuing our story of Joseph. Joseph. And this morning I'm reading from the New King James Version. When he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephraim the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abram brought, bought with the field of Ephraim the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heth. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. May the Lord bless this reading of his word. Sermon preparation begins on a Sunday morning, for me at least. And I get a title and I get some scripture figured out and I get the main points figured out and I fire that off to those who need it to play in their part of the worship. And one of the people that gets this Sunday morning email is the platform elder. So I said, Dale. You might want to make sure you have someone who can pronounce the big words. You did good, Susan. Genesis chapter 49, God took Jacob up to a spiritual mountaintop by revealing to him the future of his extended family. And then in the rest of that chapter, Jacob shares with each of his sons what's going to happen to their immediate family. And then he passes away at the age of 47. So Jacob is no longer on the scene. And we will spend today thinking about Joseph. Now when you think about Joseph, he's kind of an impressive individual to me at least. Uh, No one in the Bible except maybe Jesus himself controlled negative emotions to the extent that Joseph did. When he had every reason to be anger or bitter or harsh... Joseph never allowed those negative emotions to dictate his actions. Yeah, he felt mad, and yeah, he felt angry and betrayed and hurt. But that didn't dictate how he acted. When he had the chance to take revenge on those who made him feel those negative emotions, he didn't do that either. So in my world, few people demonstrate the emotional control of Joseph. Yet we come to a rather significant event in his life. Genesis chapter 50, verse 1. His father has just passed away. Then Joseph fell on his father's face, wept over him, and kissed him. Seems like an appropriate expression of grief to me. Grief reveals, when expressed appropriately, that we are loving other people just as God instructs us to love them. Psychology tells us that it's not really healthy if we block, truncate, interfere with the grieving process. Because it's the grieving process that allows us to have the emotional health that God wants us to have in the first place. So Joseph grieving the loss of his father is an appropriate response to what he has just experienced. Now during this grieving process, it's important that the individual needs to come to terms with the loss of the loved one and to figure out how they're going to focus their life for the remainder of their time without that loved one. So Joseph is grieving his father's death. And to help to put that into perspective, I want you to turn over to the 121st Psalm. 
Kind of keep your finger in Genesis. We'll be back in a minute. But to help you understand what Joseph is doing and going through and how he's coping, I want us to look at Psalms 121, 121 and we're going to start in verse 1. He has just gone through probably the most traumatic experience in his life. Psalms 121, verse 1, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. Now, that's a nice verse and nice passage and it helps us to take some Strength in situations that aren't really pleasant for us either. But I want you to look at verse 2 for a moment. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I have books written by those people. And those scholars tell us that this verse 2 suggests that our true help comes from an ongoing personal walk with God before the event. Now, to help you put that into perspective, I'm going to pick on one of our elders, Bill Beckworth. You know, uh, several years ago now, Bill was involved in a rather tragic truck accident. The story is he was reaching for his cell phone. But we won't go there because Becky, Connie, sorry, Connie hasn't let him forget that. But he recovered pretty quickly from a rather tragic accident. And if you know Bill's life, you know what contributed to his speedy recovery from a life-threatening accident. That's because he was walking three miles a day, every day, before the tragedy. It didn't do him any good to wait till the tragedy hit to start walking. He couldn't even get out of bed then. And yet sometimes that's how we operate. God, I can handle this. Don't need you. Don't bother yourself. I'm okay. Until we realize we're not okay. And we haven't invested in the relationship beforehand. When you think about Joseph's life, the ones we've looked at now for about 12 Sabbaths, I think you will agree with me that he has an ongoing, personal, intimate relationship with God. So in the moment of his greatest need, when his father passes and he's experiencing this tremendous grief, the relationship is there to sustain him during his difficult times. And the good news for those of us who will grieve, and we all will, God never deserts his faithful children. Now, if the relationship isn't where it needs to be, it isn't God who left. Now, Joseph is grieving his dear father. He's relying on a relationship that he has established over years of time with God. And the loss is intense. Like all of us, one of the issues is, now what do I do? Not in a personal sense, because Joseph's okay with that. What do I do with this dead corpse that's here on the bed? In our society, we work really hard to get that taken care of quickly so we can go back to our normal life. We go out of our way. Some of us already have the plans in place that all you got to do is activate them. That's not what Joseph does. Go back to Genesis chapter 50, verse 2. Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for him, for such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned him seventy days in total. 
these verses begin to detail a very descriptive funeral, perhaps the most descriptive funeral in all of the Bible. And Jacob is treated like royalty in Egyptian society, which is really a testament to how they feel about Joseph who got him through all the famine we spent some time on months ago. Forty days of embalming, that's a really gruesome process if you don't know what they're doing, followed by 30 days of mourning. After the embalming, there's another month of feeling bad. Now, during this process, Joseph is grieving, which is the appropriate thing to do. At the end of the 70 days, notice what he does. We're in verse 40. And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the hearing of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am dying in my grave which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. Now that strikes me as odd. The prime minister of the country... Number two in power, who can order physicians to embalm his dad, doesn't talk to the Pharaoh directly. Why? Why would such a powerful, gifted individual who saved the country from the famine... Not talk to the Pharaoh himself. You're waiting for me to answer that question, aren't you? I don't have one. Nor do the Bible commentaries. So work on that yourself. Kind of hang it out there and just leave it. You guys will be thinking for the next few minutes. Joseph arranges the most impressive funeral procession recorded in the Bible. Genesis 57, 50 verse 7. Jo- Joseph went to, up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the house of Joseph, his brothers, his father's house. Only the little ones, their flocks and their herds were left behind in Goshen. Put this in perspective, all of the family, all of the leaders of the country walk to Charleston, South Carolina. I wouldn't even drive to Charleston, South Carolina for a funeral. These folks walked. Some of them rode in chariots. Joseph and his brothers and all of Pharaoh's officers travel to the promised land to bury Jacob. Joseph is demonstrating his belief in God's faithfulness that the promised land really is going to be the promised land. And I demonstrate that faith by walking there and back. Faith Influences behavior. Legitimate faith influences what we do. With their father gone, the brothers get a little nervous. The brothers fear there's going to be a reprisal. Makes sense to me. Genesis 50, verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. Really? (laughs) Now think about this for a moment. The brothers have mistreated their youngest brother, well not, younger brother, lots and lots 
in lots of times. Then the brother saves them from famine. Then the brother brings them to Goshen. Then the brother gets them a job with the Pharaoh. And the whole time, the brothers are scared to death that they're going to get paid back for the mistreatment. Living with that fear all those years. Now the brothers knew Joseph's love for Jacob was pretty strong. It wouldn't allow Joseph to take revenge even if he wanted to. Because it would offend his father. And that was while Jacob was alive. But now he's dead. And in verse 16, we read, So they, the brothers, sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded us, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Bible doesn't tell us whether the brothers made that story up or not. That was the first thing I tried to figure out. Like, is this for real? We have no idea if Joseph... I'm sorry, if Jacob actually told his sons to do that with Joseph. But I guess it's not really important because either way, whether it's true or whether the brothers made it up, the message includes a clear confession of what they did wrong all those years ago and is a plea for forgiveness. So here's the real lesson I want us to think about when we're looking at Joseph and his fearful brothers. Whatever problem affects us, just like whatever problem is affecting Joseph, the problem isn't the issue. The issue is how we choose to respond to the problem. So many times we spend all of our energy... Hold on a second. Okay, I'm back. We spend all of our energy worrying about the problem, like the fan blowing the pages of my Bible. All of our energy is on, oh, poor me. Where what's really important is how we respond to the situation. You see, the reason that's so important is because our response reveals... Our character. It reveals the degree to which we trust God to be actually sitting on the throne of the universe. That's not in my notes. <laughs> but good point. It's easy to be a Christian when everything's going well. Oh, it's a Christian thing to do to smile and be happy. And I can do that when I am... Happy. When everything's going my way. Well, what about when the storms of life come? How's our response then? When the storms come, are we still that happy Christian? Or are you like me and complain a lot? Some of you know that when I was the executive officer to the commanding general at Charleston Air Force Base, I had a 26-foot sailboat. I had bought the boat six months before I became the executive officer to the commanding general of Charleston Air Force Base when I was just this little detachment guy who worked like 40, 45 hours a day, had every weekend free, and a Charleston a day, is that what I said? I was thinking about being the exec. Did I say day? That's what happens when I ad lib and don't look at my notes. Yeah, I felt that way. I have this sailboat. And if you've ever been to Charleston, you know there's a pretty nice harbor there. 
It's a really a nice harbor. It's the place where two rivers, the Ashley and the Cooper, empty before it goes out to um, the ocean. On one of those rivers, there was back then a major naval base with a nuclear sub-base right next to it. And that's a whole other story I'll tell you later. But I had this sailboat. Oh, it was a great sailboat. 26-foot sailboat. I was a really a good fair-weather sailor. You'll get that in a minute. I became the executive officer of the commanding general Charleston Air Force Base and had zero time for my sailboat. So luckily, about once a month, I would put the general on an airplane and send him to Europe for three or four days, which allowed the rest of us staff to go, huh. Barry Creighton, the vice commander, literally was born and raised and went to school until he was out of elementary school on an island in the Chesapeake Bay, which is really cool. So he was my mentor on sailing that I didn't get to do because I was the executive officer. So he said, hey, Jeff, I can teach you how to really sail if you'd like. I go, how are we going to do that? He goes, we'll get the weatherman to tell us when the worst afternoon tropical thunderstorm is going to hit. And I'll take you out sailing. If the wind was over like 10 knots, I put the sails down, used the motor, and went back to the slip. I didn't, I didn't go out there. Because the boat's lean like this. So Barry Creighton said, when the wind really gets bad and the storms are really bad, that's when you really can learn to sail. I know I've been there. I can teach you. I'll take you out. My response is, not on your life. I never went. Sometimes our Christianity is like that. It's okay when everything's fine. Winds aren't too strong. Difficulties aren't too bad. But somehow when the storms of life get pretty bad, we don't think it's going to work right. Somehow we don't have enough faith that God really is God. Find Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14, look at verse 26. In the fear of the Lord, that word fear means respect. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence and his children will have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life to avoid the snare of death. If I would have had enough faith in Barry Creighton, who was born and raised on the Chesapeake Bay and probably sailed through a storm or two in his life, I would have gone with him because I know he would have taken care of me. Not me, man. Uh -uh. I don't have that kind of faith. When the storms of life make it hard to be a Christian, do we believe God can handle it or do we think we're in trouble? And what we think influences how we act. Joseph knew God was God. Okay, I'm in this well. Doesn't seem very nice down here, but God's still God. Okay, I am a slave. This isn't too cool, but God's still God. I'm falsely accused by the wife of my master. This isn't going to turn out well, but God is still God. So... The brothers, fearful of revenge, approach Joseph and go, mm, we're sorry. <laughs> please, 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 please forgive us. Genesis 15, 18. Then his brothers also went and fell down before him. Remember the first time they sent messengers. Then his, the brothers went face to face, fell down and said, Behold, we are your servants. The brothers who sold the young whippersnapper into slavery decades ago now come and say, 
just don't kill us. We'll be your slaves. I think they had reason to fear. If I was Joseph, they would have had reason to fear. <laughs> I don't like being violated the first time, let alone three times. How would this young whippersnapper, younger brother, who they violated, respond? Verse 19. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I... I, for am I in the place of God? That wasn't the response they were expecting. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Consider the spiritual maturity of Joseph. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God is still God. In this statement, Joseph is revealing that he understood a truth that wouldn't be written for about 2,000 years. Find the book of Romans, land in chapter 8. And if you don't have this committed to memory, you should. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And we know. Then say we understand. We've been told. We know. In the very core of our being, that God is still God. You and I will never fully profit from our problems until you know that verse is true. Unless we truly believe the promise, you can't forgive those who mistreat you. You spend all your energy focusing on the problem, and our response does not please God. Unless you understand the verse, Romans 8, 28, you will never be cured of your anger, bitterness, resentment. You will never provide the forgiveness that is necessary to break the cycle. Until you know that God is God. Now you can read the scriptures from cover to cover and you'll never find a promise that God makes that you and I aren't going to experience problems or tragedies in this life. It's not in there. But there is a kind of an impressive promise, at least impressive in my mind. In the book of Isaiah, which they've moved, oh there it is. Isaiah chapter 43. I hope. Isaiah 43, land in verse 2. Isaiah 43, 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you, for I am the Lord your God. Now, either that's true or God's a liar. Which one's true? Either that statement is absolutely true, and no situation will you ever experience that God can't see you through, or that's a lie and we might as well go home. You can't have it both ways. Either he is or he ain't. And if he is, then you and I can respond to all those unpleasant experiences just like Joseph did. Because God's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We can respond if we want to. But if you're like me, you kind of like getting mad. So I'm going to help you think about how problems can profit you 
in four different ways. See, some of us think, oh, I don't have any troubles today. First way our problems help us is they draw us closer to God. Joseph's problem, starting with being tossed into the well, let, left him no place to turn except to God. Picture yourself at the bottom of an empty, dry well. After trying to climb up and realizing that ain't going to work, the only place you have to look is up. Don't steal my lines. I set that up. I get the punchline. The problems force us to look to God. Now, it's silly sometimes to understand that only a fool waits till he's flat on his back to look up. But some of us have been foolish in our lives. But problems are there as a tool to help us draw closer to a loving Heavenly Father. Without the problems, we think we can do it on our own. That's not what God wants. In the dark and confusing times when you're down in the well and all you're doing is looking up, I want you to think about Psalms 119, verse 5. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 105. 119, 105. It's in here somewhere. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and confirmed that I will keep your righteous judgment. Verse 107. I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. The first way problems help us is it draws us closer to God. The second way problems profit us is they help us mature a little bit as a Christian. Amen. You see, most of us are so concerned about this life here and now. God's more concerned about your eternity and he wants you to be ready to spend it with him. Amen. We like, oh, if I just had a nice new car and some new shoes and all the food I want to eat. And God said, if you just not be so materialistic, you and I could have a better relationship. Oh, if I could just have the girlfriend I've been looking for all my life, the one I want. God says, hey, I got a plan for you, Westbrook. If you just stick with me, I'll get you to the wife that you need to have so you can be the person I want you to be. Amen. We got to grow up a little bit. In the midst of his tragedy and his problems... Joseph became prime minister of the most powerful nation in the world at the age of 30. That's pretty impressive. The same process that matured Joseph is available to you and I. Because it's the same God that he served that we serve. So what's the process look like that helped Joseph become a prime minister at the age of 30? That's available to you. Turn to the book of James, chapter 1. James, chapter 1. We'll start in verse 2. The half-brother of Jesus says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. No, I don't want to be in various trials. I want that simple, smooth road to follow. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God, who gives it liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave on the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not the, that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded unstable in all his ways. If you want to grow up into the Christian God wants you to be, you're going to have to choose to profit from problems. Because God wants you to be ready for the end, and he knows there's some work in your life that needs to be done. 
And either you go with the easy, simple lessons, or he gets a bigger two by four. Third way, problems allow us to profit is they help us to learn. If you use them correctly. Problems are often of our own making. I'm a diabetic today because of bad choices I've made for the last 30 years. This is going to be a long sermon on page 4. I'm not making this up. This is a, hopefully a short story. Brand new second lieutenant. In the Air Force you have, oh, it starts earlier than that. I'm 10 years old. I played little league football, the same little league football that cost me the teeth in my upper jaw. You have to weigh in because you can't weigh over a certain weight. Because there's little teeny kids, young, middle-aged kids, and real old kids, and they're controlled by weight. So before every game, you have to weigh in. And you, here's the scale, here's the limit. And I'm four pounds over, so I can't play today. The other team has six players over the limit. Both coaches agree, it doesn't matter, everybody can play today. So what did I take from that lesson? I'm important, I'm worth six of them. God was trying to say, hey, kid, you might not want to have so many Oreos and milk in, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning. You guys are liking this story. <laughs> I'm in the Air Force now. I'm over here with my Air Force buddy. We have to pass a physical every year, and you have to weigh in every year. Remember those days? If you're not, you put on what's called the Fat Boy Program. That's really what it's called, Right? I was put on that twice in my Air Force career. Because I don't learn lessons real quick, apparently. My Air Force career is over. I become a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They have this health message thing. Or so I've been told. Because there's lots to learn, and I choose not to focus on that area of the doctrine. I'm an Adventist for, count them, five years. With all the resources about health and diet, counsels on eating, that kind of stuff. Before I ever contract the disease of diabetes. Don't you think somewhere along the way I could have learned the lesson? But no, every morning I get to grab some fat, stick a needle in it. The story of blood sugar above 400 and below 50, I know what she's talking about. Problems help us to learn if we will allow them to. Jesus is the best teacher. God is also the best disciplinarian. If you study that word, discipline means teach. Westbury, you got a few lessons to learn. You could learn them the easy way, or I'm just going to keep beating you over the head until you give in. Now, I don't eat Oreos now. Potato chips, we're still working on. Turn to Proverbs chapter 6. Somewhere, it's near Psalms, which is where we are. Psalms chapter 6, verse 27. Uh, that's one of those P words. Let's try Proverbs. I'm trying to edit because you've already been listening too long. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 27. Can a man make a fire to his bosom? I'm sorry, take a fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not get scorched? The answer to those questions, by the way, is no. We're not going to delve into this a whole lot. Let me just simply say that fire is a symbol for sin. And there are consequences to your decisions. Problems can teach you what you need to learn. 
if you let them. Finally, prophets can profit you because they're one of God's most efficient tools in helping us become the child he's called us to be. I'm waiting for the train to pass because the next is one of my punchlines. They're not very good and I've got to use them for all I can. These two guys are having a great time over here. Ben Franklin. You guys know who Ben Franklin is? All right. He once said, experience is the best teacher, but only a fool will learn by no other method. Experience is the best teacher, but a fool will learn by no other method. God's plan is that his children would read this book and learn from the experiences of others. How good do you think we are at doing that? <laughs> oh, that's a stupid question. Several recent social science or research shows Christians aren't very good at following God's plan. Americans love the Bible. The average American home has five of them. We just don't read the thing. Less, this, these are scary. Less than 20% of churchgoers read their Bible daily. Really? 20% of churchgoers read their Bible daily. 10% of professed Christians, only 10% of professed Christians have read the entire Bible. Seems like most of us want to be foolish and learn the hard way. God can teach us through the problems of others. That's why you have the thing. He can teach us through our own problems, and he will if you don't take the path of least resistance. We bring problems on ourselves with bad decisions, as I've demonstrated for the last 30 years. Sometimes they're caused by other people, and sometimes they're caused by the devil, like in Job's case. The source of the problem is not important. We sometimes want to talk about the problem because we don't want to learn the lesson. The problem isn't the issue, no matter what the source. God can use problems to make us better. Find Proverbs, really Proverbs, chapter 20, land in verse 30. Oh, I'm supposed to read this. Okay, got it. hate it when I can't figure out my own notes. I'm reading from the NIV because it makes more sense. Uh, Proverbs 20, 30. Blows and wounds cleanse away evil, and beatings purge the inmost being. If you don't learn the easy way, God has other ways of helping you learn. My suggestion is go with the simple way first. From a purely sanctification point of view, what really matters is not the problem, not what happens to us. What really matters is what happens in us. See, God's over here worrying about eternity, and he knows there's some things in you and in me that need some work. So we can profit from those situations that are unpleasant, and become the child God wants us to be. And maybe we can learn some other lessons. The final year of Joseph's life. We're back to Genesis chapter 50. I'm done beating you up for a while. Joseph lived in Egypt 50 years after his father passed away. He dies at the age of 110. And although his parting words are kind of short, they're pretty powerful. Turn to Genesis chapter 50, verse 24. Genesis 50, 24. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's it. Then he dies. Of all the experiences he could talk about, all the lessons he learned. He simply says, God is faithful. He will do what he says. Amen. 
Do we believe that? Do we really believe that? Or do we just want to be fair weather sailors? Oh, I like the little hat. You get this little hat and you're holding on to the tiller and the boat's going through the water. All right, one more story about the sailboat. We're in the Ashley River. That's where the Navy bases are. I'm sailing upriver back to the mooring, which is at the Navy base. Okay, visualize I'm in a 26-foot sailboat. The place I'm going is about three miles up the river. My sailboat's perfect. It's trimmed. The sails are very right. The little pieces of, uh, what do you sew with? Wool. Th you, know, um, you have these little things tied on so you can see where the wind is. Everything's perfect. Man, I'm doing it great. And you know, the boat's leaned over, we're moving, the, my little knot meter, speedometer, says, you know, 4.3 knots. I'm cooking, this is so cool, I am the neatest guy in the world. Now I'm looking up where I'm going. On the radio, which is about right here, I hear, white sailboat. <laughs> I'm the only sailboat in the river. This is the USS Nautilus, some nuclear sub. We would like you to get out of the channel. Oh, dear. I said, and I, I, it shows you how stupid I am. I'm on the radio, so the whole world are here. I say, I'm making 4.3 knots. <laughs> like I'm going to rationalize with this 20,000 tons he responds to me, the current is 4.3 knots. You're not moving a foot. <laughs> okay, I'll finish that story. It's going to be a record for sermon length. So, I kind of admit I'm stupid. So I turn the boat, and I'm now aimed at the shoreline, which is the shortest distance to get out of the channel, which is where he is going. So I'm heading this way, you know, and there are buoys that will mark the channel, so I, I've passed the buoy, and so I know I'm safe from him. And then I look forward, and the edge of the river is right there. So now I'm caught between running aground on the river and being run over. Anybody a sailor, by the way? Some of you have done this? Okay. So I have to do what's called come about. That means you've got to point your nose through the wind and go the other way. It's kind of eventful. There are lots of things going on. So I have to do that pretty quick because i got about 25 seconds before I, me and the land meet. So I do that. And I get that executed. And now I'm pointed back towards the channel where this 20,000 ton, 300 foot nuclear submarine is Literally right there. And I'm going this way, and I'm getting closer to the sub and the sub, and, and I'm like, come on, come on. So I kind of start adjusting my course, and I literally go through the wake of the nuclear submarine, you know, the turbulent water right behind it, because I didn't want to run into him, and I didn't want to run aground. So I'm now in the turbulence of the nuclear sub, and I'm facing the river again, the shoreline over here again. I don't think I told Karen that story for about three or four months because I didn't want to have to share that. Sometimes <laughs> things don't go well. Joseph could tell lots of stories like I just did, but all he shares is God is faithful. He'll do what he says. Whether you're running aground over here on the river bank, whether you're running into the nuclear submarine, or you're on the Ferris wheel in the wake of the submarine, it doesn't matter. God is still God. Yes. What Satan wants is us to think about the river bank, the nuclear submarine, or the turbulent water I'm in. Yes. What God wants you to think about is him sitting on the throne of the universe. We are, in a few minutes, completing our store, our journey with Joseph. We're starting a new series next week. It's 
been kind of a fun trip. I think it's been fun. Joseph has gone from tragedy to triumph, has taken us from the pit to the palace, and he's finally now being taken back to the promised land. It was a rather exciting journey for him and for us, I think. But what made it exciting were all the problems and challenges he experienced. The same is true with your spiritual journey. If we never had a problem, our lives would be boring. Because you would never see God intercede in your life. If there wasn't a challenge, there would be no need for a savior. God turns tragedies into triumphs and along the way helps us to become the children he wants us to be so we can spend eternity with him. That's how problems are profitable for you. So if you're in a problem, don't pray to God to get me out of the problem. Pray to God, help me to learn the lesson so you can take the problem away. But Satan doesn't want us to think like that. Satan wants us to be so self-absorbed that all we fear is, oh, my toe hurts. I need a new shoe. <laughs> you guys got to sit in the back from now on. <laughs> focus on what God wants you to focus on. Learn the lessons God wants you to learn. Become the child God wants you to be. Amen. So we're ready to see Jesus when he comes in the clouds. By the way, our next series is on 1 Corinthians chapter 13. There'll be 12 or 13 sermons from that one chapter alone. It's on how to have better relationships, and I'll work in more of the sailboat story, I'm sure. In number 520? Well, that's where I got 520 from. <laughs> you can all stand, please. We'll sing together. My soul.
Father, thank you that Jesus is our Savior. Thank you that you provide the Holy Spirit. And thank you that you have already won the victory over our enemy. May we always be mindful that you are sitting on the throne of the universe. And nothing happens without your approval. And that you have the ability to turn even the worst situation into something that will help us to be the child that you have called us to be. So that we may spend eternity with you. Help us to that end is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.